All eyes in recent weeks have been on the House of Representatives. Democrats have complained the House Intelligence Committee chairman can't be impartial. And House Republicans are trying to move on after the failure of their Affordable Care Act replacement bill. Oregon Democrat Earl Blumenauer has made it his mission to resist President Trump's agenda in the House. Blumenauer joins us tonight to discuss the first three months of the Trump presidency and his plans in Congress moving forward. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and thank you for joining us for Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Oregon Congressman Earl Blumenauer represents the state's third district. The lifelong Portland resident was first elected to Congress in 1996. He has been a harsh critic of President Trump and has introduced a bill called the No Trump Act. It would prevent taxpayer dollars from being used to pay for events, overnight stays, or food at hotels operated by the president and his relatives. The congressman has also been vocal about his opposition to the Republicans' plan to replace Obamacare, which failed last week. Here to give us his take on the first months of the Trump presidency, welcome to my guest, Oregon Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Congressman, welcome back to Straight Talk. Nice to have you here. Thank you, Laurel. It's always a pleasure. Your first time here since President Trump took office, so a lot to talk about. Let's start with Russia. Uh, the questions about Russia, its involvement in our election, and possible ties to the Trump administration. You have said, like many Americans, you're very concerned. There are serious questions that remain. The House Intelligence Committee has stalled and broiled in controversy, but the Senate Intelligence Committee is moving forward. They started hearings on Thursday. How do you think things are going to play out with this? You know, it's fascinating. Almost every day there's another layer of the onion that uh, is peeled back. We see more engagement, particularly from people in the Trump orbit, his relatives, people who worked on his campaign. Now they may attempt to minimize it. It was fascinating that the, his press secretary claimed that his former campaign chairman just really wasn't involved with the campaign. Kind of, what? <laughs> I mean, we're going to see that on Saturday Night Live. Um, the evidence, though, is, I think, clear and unmistakable. The Russians were, in fact, interfering in the American elections, and there are close and troubling ties between people in the Trump orbit uh, and Russians. Uh, it's all going to come out one way or another. We still have the FBI uh, investigating uh, the Senate is moving ahead. Now, what about the House? With the chairman, uh, Devin Nunes, there's a lot of controversy. Uh, Democrats saying he's too close to the White House. Do you think he should step aside? Well, one would think. I mean, when you rush up to the White House to be able to get special information from people in the White House, and then you treat it as it's some new revelation that actually is uh, providing cover for the White House, uh, it doesn't just look strange. I mean, it's wrong. Uh, Devin has, I think, compromised his ability to move forward. There's no sense that there's any bipartisan cooperation. The contrast with the Senate could not be uh, more stark. Um, I think he should step aside. Um, maybe somebody else should step in. Uh, but it's been we'll totally compromised. Will we have an independent investigation, an independent I would, prosecutor? I think we may reach the point where that's necessary. I mean, I personally would feel more comfortable. This is unprecedented. I'm, I've been uh, watching these uh, events for a long time. We've never seen anything as blatant as the involvement that the Russians had in the election. Um, and we had, you know, the... <laughs> the presidential candidate of the Republicans at that point, Trump when he was just the nominee, uh, inviting the Russians to engage. Uh, it's not just unseemly, it's dangerous. Do you think that the committees will be able to compel the president to turn over his tax returns? Do you think that's necessary? Well, I think it is uh, important to do. Every presidential candidate since Richard Nixon, except for a couple of years when we had Gerald Ford, they all release it. Uh, Mitt Romney, as a nominee, released years of his tax returns. Uh, Donald Trump said he was going to release it. Uh, but given all these interactions with the Russia and the vast connections with his far-flung business interests, where basically he's, it's just his brand that he is trafficking in, 
Um, I think it raises serious questions about entanglement. Uh, you know, what was the deal with the f home that Trump bought for $40 million that he flipped soon thereafter to a Russian for $100 million? And we're finding a number of Russians invested in his projects, uh, people who are the oligarchs, I mean, the close to the thugs that run Russia, uh, raises troubling, troubling issues. Um, I do think that he should uh, turn over his tax returns, make them public, lay to rest any questions. Um, it's part of this notion where people are losing confidence in, ter uh, in the president, uh, in keeping his word, in what he has done, um, and that's not healthy for America. We'll be hearing more in the weeks ahead on that. Another hot topic, immigration this week. Immigration and Customs Enforcement officials arrested 84 undocumented immigrants in Oregon and Washington. ICE says 60 had a criminal history, 24 did not. We know two dreamers that were detained, two from the Portland area. And you tweeted about one uh, last weekend. Agents picked up from southeast Portland dreamer, 25-year-old. Francisco Rodriguez Dominguez and whisked him away to a detention center in Tacoma without a warrant. He came here when he was five years old. After a lot of public outcry, he was released. But was there a lot going on behind the scenes when uh, that happened? Yeah, you know, this is you know this is an example. This is a by all accounts a very fine young man uh, who works uh, out uh, in uh, Mid County, being involved with educational counseling. He's a good citizen. Uh, to have him swept up. Um, and and it's this is happening repeatedly. I've heard from people who are deeply concerned about what's going to happen in Oregon's farming industry, nursing industry, wine industry. Uh, we have people who are afraid to go to health clinics, to go to court. People who are involved with domestic violence situations who are more afraid of their government than their abuser. That doesn't make anybody safer. And it's sending shock waves uh, that are widely felt. We have in this country about 10 million families that have at least one member who's undocumented. And we focus on the Latino community, but there are 50,000 Irish people who are here without proper documentation. There's a half million people from India. So there are a number of, of ethnic groups that are deeply involved in the community, uh, involved with the economy. Um, and this is something that doesn't serve anybody. And you interest. had a, a roundtable discussion on Friday morning. We're taping Friday afternoon, along with Congresswoman Bonamici, to, to try to produce legislation that would offer these sensitive areas, like schools and courtrooms, where they wouldn't be afraid of ICE agents. Tell us how that would work. Well, we had, it was actually a, a terrific conversation with a variety of people, with law enforcement, local government, people who are providing aid and assistance to, to immigrants. Uh, what the legislation would entail is expanding a zone around areas that should basically be non-political, places that we want immigrants to go. We want them to go to court if they have problems with the legal system. Uh, we want them to keep their doctor's appointment. If we have children of immigrants who are sick and not treated, that is a threat to everybody. There's no useful purpose served by not having people be able to do these basic functions. And so having courthouses, having schools, having medical facilities with a zone of safety uh, to uh, enable people to take advantage of those services uh, is important, not just in terms of the legislation that would expand that uh, air, that boundary, but also sending a signal that the, the ICE should be involved in a thoughtful and humane way, not being involved with ruth ruthless uh, persecution. You know, Congressman, people. there are a lot of Oregonians who, um, some of them write me, who say that they support the president's tougher stance on immigration. They think people should have to come here legally, whether it's from Mexico or Ireland or India and that the people here illegally know that they've broken the laws. They've had some time to get their, their things in order, and they think ICE is doing the right thing. How would you respond to them? Well, uh, we do want to respect the immigration laws, but the problem that we've got in this country is that we have come to rely upon vast numbers of people. We couldn't run Oregon agriculture without immigrants. Uh, what would happen to the hospitality industry? 16% uh, of the construction industry uh, are people who are not documented. 
um, we have had a, a sort of a, a schizophrenic attitude. We don't want them, but we rely heavily upon them. And in the meantime, we have millions of people who are a part of this community, many of them for years. Many of them have children here who are citizens. And we have many more who were brought here when they were babies or small kids. And so to just ruthlessly enforce the letter of the law is actually inhumane and is not very reasonable. You know, I, I find it interesting. There are some people who want the letter of the law enforced. I wonder how many speeding tickets they would get if the letter of the law were enforced. There's a zone of enforcement here. There are people who understand that there's a give and take. And I just think that we're better off having a system of immigration that speaks to the reality. Ronald Reagan had a program where we had immigration reform. It's long overdue now. But to think we're going to deport or force out of the country 11 or 12 million people who are part of the community and part of the economy is unrealistic and I don't think it makes sense. Let's, let's move on to health care. Like, there's a, a lot more to talk one. about yeah. on immigration, but yeah, we have to talk about health care. The Republicans uh, failed to get enough votes to pass their replacement bill for the Affordable Care Act and they withdrew it. President Trump saying Obamacare will remain in place for the foreseeable future. You had continued to call for resistance. Do you think that made a difference? I think what people did around the country uh, speaking out against uh, the dismantling of, a, of the Affordable Care Act, which is working. I mean, we have the lowest uninsured rate in our nation's history. We have kept the rate of medical inflation the lowest it's been in 50 years. We've been able to get care to people who otherwise would not have had it. The opioid crisis, for instance, with the expansion uh, with Medicaid here in Oregon, we've had ability to deal with people with addiction, with mental care, and we have stabilized the financing of Oregon's hospitals. Uh, people who previously would have gotten care in an emergency room and the costs would have been shifted off to all the rest of them are now getting it in clinics in a timely fashion and it's being paid for. People spoke out, people understood, and it really helped us bring that proposal down. There are a lot of Democrats, including Senator Bernie Sanders, who say Obamacare does have problems, that the deductibles are too high, the premiums are too high, the cost of health care is higher than it should be, that um, some of the insurance companies are moving out of the marketplace. Doesn't there need to be some fixes? Well, well those to are it? different issues. But what's the solution? I mean, Where do we well, go next? I think what we should have been doing all along is taking the Affordable Care Act and working to make it better. No piece of legislation is on a major grand scale is introduced and is perfect. There were changes that I would have made. Uh, but what my friends on the Republican side did was spend six years chipping away at it six years trying to discourage people from using it. So where do we go they, from here? Well, I mean, just but one, of the, one of the big problems is that they've been undercutting it. For example, uh, 19 states did not expand Medicaid coverage to poor people. Where it ought to go from here is let it rest, allow it to function, let's work on dealing with things that we know we, we should be working on, getting deductibles and premium costs down. But that is by expanding the market, getting more people in, not discouraging young, healthy people from getting insurance, which Donald Trump and the Republicans are doing. And that's an important part of the key going forward. And Senator Sanders is now talking about a single payer, uh, Medicare for all, something that I understand you support and that he will reach out to President Trump on that. What are the chances that something like that would get any traction? Well, I think. Uh, this country within the next 10 years is going to move in that direction. I think uh, the potential of expanding Medicare coverage, allowing some younger people to buy into it, makes a lot of sense. Um, people on the other side were arguing against, you know, you don't want anything like a single payer, like that's what they have in Canada. Well, Canada, people live longer, they get sick less often, they get well faster, and it costs much less than in the United States. Uh, being able to have an expansion of Medicare to more people, um, I think, is something that inevitably we will be doing, rather than the patchwork that we have now. In the meantime, let's make that patchwork work 
better um, and being able to work together on refinements to bring down the cost of health care. That's not something that we've been focusing on. Oregon has been doing it with our Medicaid expansion. We've actually retained the ability to keep Medicare cost increases lower than the national average by billions of dollars. Uh, these are things that we can work on together that will make a difference. President Trump signed a, a sweeping executive order on Tuesday at the Environmental Protection Agency, which officials say looks to curb the federal government's enforcement of climate regulations by putting American jobs above addressing climate change. And you tweeted afterwards, we will resist. Let's listen to what the president and his interior secretary had to say about it. The action I'm taking today will eliminate federal overreach restore economic freedom, and allow our companies and our workers to thrive, compete, and succeed on a level playing field. The people who are actually in the business uh, applaud this effort, believe that it will do a lot to revive the industry. Well, we're going to do it right. Uh, again, it is better to produce energy here under reasonable regulation. So what, what's your reaction to well, that? Well, nobody suggests we shouldn't produce energy here. In fact, we have twice as many solar jobs as we do in uh, the coal, fossil fuel industry. Um, they're not going to bring coal jobs back. Coal jobs are gone because they've mechanized the mines and because companies are deciding to use natural gas, which is rather plentiful and cheap, rather than expensive and dirty coal. Uh, that's not going to change. The rest of the world is moving forward. It's interesting that the Chinese are loving this. They are exerting their leadership in alternative energy. And I've toured some of those facilities in China with wind, with solar. Uh, these are technologies that we developed in the United States. We're losing our leadership uh, to the Chinese, to the Japanese. Uh, that makes no sense. There are a lot of Oregonians in the rural parts of the state who feel like a lot of the regulations have put a stranglehold on them and their economy, their employment, unemployment is higher. Is there a way to, to have loosen some of these regulations and also protect the environment? Well, the envi actually, the regulations that we have encouraging the development of alternative energy has been a boon to rural America. Go out the gorge and look at the windmill farms. They're paying money to people in the community for being able to establish them there. This is energy that doesn't uh, go to some foreign country. Uh, these are renewable items that are going to have actually lower cost over the long term and they don't pollute the environment. Uh, the notion that I just came back from India uh, having unbridled pollution, burning lots of coal, uh, is not something that is desirable by any stretch of the imagination. It's bad for the health of, it's bad uh, in terms of being able to maintain a, a business climate that people want to invest in, that people want to visit. Um, and this, this, the good news is that the public is not going to turn their back. Trump can make it harder but we're not going to reverse these efforts, and I think the public will, in fact, resist this nonsense. Congressman, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions has suggested the feds may crack down on legal marijuana. I know you've introduced some legislation uh, about the marijuana industry, but we'll talk about that after the break. We're back in two minutes. <laughs> 